Okay, so for the last part of the course, we're going to talk about black holes. Um, these are the most mysterious and wonderful objects in the universe. They're extremely interesting for many reasons, but one of which is they're extraordinarily simple. So they're essentially like a gig gigantic elementary particle. A black hole has very, very few properties. It has a mass, it has angular momentum, generally, like spin, and uh, it may have some electric charge, but um, that's probably unlikely because anything charged in the universe quickly gets neutralized by charged particles being attracted to it and canceling the charge. So probably they only have mass and spin, um, and there are really no other features. That's, these are very, very strange and wonderful objects that are directly predicted by Einstein's theory. Uh, because they're solutions to the nonlinear equations, Einstein equations, it took people a while to understand them, and people are still struggling to understand some of the details of black holes. Uh, particularly the phenomena that go on inside the black hole, if you happen to fall into one. So, uh, so these, the other reason, of course, they're so exciting is because we can actually see them today. And so at the end of this lecture, I'll show you a couple of little movie, a movie and a picture, a projected picture. And in 2018, in fact, we should see the first real pictures of a black hole, the black hole in the center of our Milky Way, the four million solar mass black hole. So this is really an amazing time to be thinking about black holes. Um, the word itself was coined, do you know who coined the word? John Wheeler, as in many other things. Uh, he thought of the word as a kind of a joke, like the Big Bang was invented as a joke, uh, but it stuck, and the black hole certainly stuck. And I have one funny story about this, which is that I, uh, I worked with Stephen Hawking when I was at Cambridge. In fact, I'm going next week. I'm going to, to, uh, to a retreat he is holding uh, to explain why his approach to the beginning of the universe is incorrect. <laughs> you may be following my recent papers, but uh, so that should be fun. Um, but Stephen told me an amazing story that in the 1970s, when... Roger Penrose and he were working on proving singularity theorems in general relativity. These theorems say that in many situations, you can't avoid um, singularities, that the equations of general relativity lead inevitably to the formation of singularities. And at the singularities, that's where the equations fail. Uh, various quantities become infinite, the Riemann curvature becomes infinite, and the Differential equations just don't mean anything anymore. Um, so they were busy proving these singularity theorems, and Stephen went to France to talk about black holes. Um, and apparently the French refused to use the word because <laughs> it translates into French as true noir, okay, which is apparently very rude. <laughs> okay, so, so for this region, the French... <laughs> French astrophysicists didn't want to talk about it. They prefer to uh, leave it in the bathroom. And uh, so the word did not catch on for a while. And actually, they refused to believe they existed because the word didn't, uh, didn't like the word. So, <laughs> but then data came along, and, and they really do exist. So, yeah, unfortunately, Stephen does tell us slightly off-color jokes sometimes. And... Uh, I'm sorry to repeat one. Um, so what we've done is we, we showed that the Einstein equation, equation with t mu nu equals zero, so no stress energy at all, this gave uh, waves, gave gravitational waves, right? We We took g mu nu to be eta mu nu plus h mu nu, and then we showed that r mu nu is approximately minus a half box 
h mu nu, and when we set that equal to zero, we got gravitational waves. So what we're going to do today is solve exactly the same equation. Today we will solve r mu nu equals zero nonlinearly. Okay, linearly means I just perturb the metric by a small amount. So we're going to perturb the metric by an arbitrarily large amount um, and with uh, different symmetry and with a different symmetry. See, when we solve this equation, we really assumed a symmetry. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's a linear equation, so we Fourier transformed it, and then we thought about each wave one at a time. So there was a wave vector, k, and the wave only depended on e to the i k dot x. So the wave, or k dot z, right, last time, h went like e to the minus i k t plus i k z. So the wave is independent of y and x, so there's a translational symmetry, right? So there's a two-dimensional symmetry group of a plane wave, which is just translations in the y or the z uh, direction. This time we want to use a different symmetry, not translations in two dimensions. It's going to be a more, in a way, more obvious symmetry. Somebody gives you an equation, which is very complicated. You want to look for a solution. What, what makes sense as a simplifying assumption? You want to look for some kind of localized solution, a blob. How do I look for a blob? What's the simplest kind of blob? Spherical. Spherical. So spherical symmetry, right? Because we're just looking for a blob. So the person who did this first, it's a totally amazing story. Do you know who did this? Karl Schwarzschild, right? Karl Schwarzschild. So uh, this, the history is really amazing. Schwarzschild. Um, so he was a Jew in Germany uh, in the latter part of the... Um, of the 19th century. And I don't know if you know the story, but Jews were not allowed to go to university in Germany or many countries of Europe until about 1850, 1860. Uh, they said, oh, Jews are second class citizens and they, they, they're not good for science. And so they didn't allow them in, right? All the universities. But Karl Schwarzschild was one of those who was, um, Maybe his father went to university, I'm not sure, but he was one of the first to go into university. He was a prodigy uh, at school. So I think by the age of 16, he'd published two papers already on geometry. Makes you feel very little, doesn't it? Uh, but more than that, he, he went to university as one of this new generation of Jews allowed into, allowed into universities in Germany, and he had a point to prove. Right? He was determined to prove that you know, Jews can do, can do stuff too, and actually they can do it better than, you, better than anyone else can. And uh, so he was very, very highly motivated uh, young scientist, uh, like many of his contemporaries. I mean, the Jews did, were not allowed into science, and then they got into science, and then they just revolutionized everything. Right? And... Uh, so it's a very interesting phenomenon, and personally, I think that's what's going to happen when Africans get into science. They will do the same thing. They also have a point to prove. But anyway, Karl Schwarzschild got into physics and maths, um, and he did a number of uh, very, very good works. But then there was the First World War, and he joined the German army, 
and he fought on the Eastern Front in Russia. Uh, and during, in 1915, in the middle of the First World War, right, it's trench warfare and uh, cannonballs everywhere, he solved the Einstein equations. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and so he wrote to Einstein, he wrote a letter to Einstein explaining the solution, and he said, um, you know, in spite of, I, you can see this on the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page on, on him, it's just amazing. He says, uh, uh, your, your ideas have given me sort of solace in the midst of all this horrible noise and uh, killing. Uh, your equations were very great help to me in keeping me sane. Uh, unfortunately, he then contracted a disease uh, during the, on this, uh, in 1915, he contracted a nasty disease, and he died a year later when he, I think when he was back in Germany. So it's a very sad uh, story, but a uh, very remarkable individual. So we are just going to repeat what he did, and I think you will see it required some cleverness. Uh, Einstein was very surprised by this work, said, I never believed that such a simple solution would be possible, right? Because these are, these are pretty horrible equations. We know that already, right? They're really messy and all kinds of uh, nonlinear stuff. But, uh, but actually what Schwarzschild did initially was, was this. That was his assumption. Einstein had not understood spherical symmetry properly, and Schwarzschild did. And that enabled him to find. So it's easy for us to re repeat this today, but of course, but I think you'll see that it was uh, it was quite an impressive piece of work at the time. So how do we implement spherical symmetry? Uh, the way we do it is we start from the line element, right? Uh, G mu nu dx mu dx nu. Uh, that's a very fundamental quantity. That's the length squared between two uh, points separated by, by an infinitesimal distance. And so this is a nice quantity because it's independent of coordinates. Right? So I have to keep that in mind. This quantity is actually independent of coordinates. Why? Because the metric changes in just the inverse way to these things. It's designed to be... The whole theory is designed to leave this invariant under coordinate transformations. So the question is, we're going to have some four-dimensional space. We're going to have four coordinates, right? One of them will be time. And then it's useful to think of the other three as being x, some coordinates on space, and we want to implement spherical symmetry. So what does that mean? Well, spherical symmetry is not going to act on the time. It's not going to change the time. But the, on the x-coordinates, we're going to have x going to x prime equals to O x. If I write it as a, with the indices, where O is a rotation matrix. And I want the line element to be invariant. We want the line element to be invariant under rotations. OK, rotations form a group. And uh, the group is SO3, so three Euler angles. Uh, we won't need any of the details, but that's the concept, is that we're going to write down a line element insisting that there is this invariance. So what could we write down? We have to write down quantities which are invariant under rotations. So dt is a good quantity that doesn't change under rotations. Uh, T doesn't change under rotations. Uh, what about X? X is no good because it changes. So tell me something that's invariant under rotations. R. R. A 
Okay, so r squared is x squared. That's invariant under rotations. And then I can differentiating, differentiate this guy, so I can get, um, so r is obviously fine. And then I can have d, uh, r dr, which is x dx. That's fine. So dr is obviously fine. So dr is invariant under rotations. And, um, and I can write down dx squared. So dx squared is dr squared plus r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. Okay, that's just the flat space metric written in uh, spherical polars. These are spherical polars. X is R sine theta cos phi. Y is R sine theta sine phi. Z is R cos theta. And often we uh, abbreviate this to d omega 2 squared. That's the metric on a two sphere. Whoops. So obviously the constant radius surfaces, if dr is zero, that means that you're not moving in r. So you can only move in the theta and the phi directions, and that traces out a, a two sphere. So this is the metric on a two sphere. So we're allow allowed to write down all these things. And so it follows that the most general, and nothing else, by the way, nothing else will be rotationally invariant. Spherical, symmetric, metric, or line element is um, minus... So often this, we write this as ds squared, minus c of r and t, dt squared, where c is arbitrary, uh, a function of r and t. And then we can have another function of r and t times dr squared. And then we can have another function of r and t, dr, dt, dr, that's also allowed. And then we can have another arbitrary function times r squared d omega 2 squared. OK, so the claim is there is absolutely nothing else you can write down which will be invariant under SO3 rotations. Oh, um, well, it doesn't, it, it, you'll see why in a moment. It's convenient. It's convenient to put the two in there. It's not necessary because I could absorb it in the D. This is just for convenience. See, we'll see in a minute. Um, now, uh, these are not completely arbitrary uh, functions. Can you tell me there's a further constraint on, on metrics. Remember, remember what we defined a metric to be. It's a four by four matrix, which is invertible, right? And another property. Do you remember what the other property was? Symmetric. There, yeah, this is symmetric, right? This is all symmetric. In fact, this is this is symmetric under. Um, if you write this as a matrix, you would write it as uh, d t, d r, d theta phi, right? And then you would put here minus c, and then you put dt, dr, d theta, d phi, and then here you'd put a minus d and minus d, because these terms will each give one of those. We'll couple the dt to d dr. And then here you have a plus e, and then you here you'll have an f for f. Um, f r squared, and here you'll have an f r squared sine squared theta. Sorry? Must be Lorentzian. 
Must be Lorentzian. What does that, what does Lorentzian mean? Signature. Signature. Good. So we must have, have uh, that the determinant of G is not zero because it's got to be invertible. We're going to, we have to have a metric and its inverse. And so you can easily work out what's the determinant of G. Just calculate the determinant. I won't write it out, but it mustn't be zero. And it must have uh, one negative and three positive eigenvalues. Eigenvalues. <clears throat> All right, so it's already obvious that it will have two positive eigenvalues because these directions are completely positive. Right? And so there's a constraint on this matrix that that matrix must have one negative and one positive eigenvalue. So there's a time like direction and a space like direction. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind. Now, um, so far these functions are completely arbitrary, apart from the constraint on the eigenvalues. Um, it makes sense to just get rid of this guy. Why don't we just redefine all this to be uh, a new radius squared? That's an equation that gives r prime in terms of r and t. And it's absolutely fine because... F must clearly be positive, because I need three positive eigenvalues, and I have to get two of them out of here. So F has to be positive. So I can take the square root, right? So R prime is equal to square root of F times R. That's fine. OK, so, uh, so let's just do that. And of course, uh, f is a function of r and t, so we're, we're going to do a coordinate transformation. t prime equals t. r prime is f of r and t, the r, uh, sorry, times r. And now what, now what we do is calculate, um, uh, calculate dr prime in terms of dr and dt, and dt prime, then we invert those relations to get dt and dr. So we won't actually do any of this, but dr prime equals something times dr plus something times dt. dt prime equals dt. We invert this to get dr equals something times dr prime plus something times dt prime, etc. And then plug it all back into there. And clearly, the first three terms are not going to give anything new. They will just redefine all the coefficients, right? Because you're just mixing dt and dr. But all, all this is is some quadratic form involving dt and dr. So, so we get some new ds squared is minus c prime, r prime e prime, dt prime squared, plus e prime, r prime, t prime, the r squared, minus 2d prime, r prime, t prime, dt prime, dr prime, plus r prime squared, the omega 2 squared, where these c prime, e prime, and d prime are just some new functions. They were arbitrary anyway. And so let's just do this, and then we'll drop the primes. OK, this, since the coordinates were uh, our choice anyway. So now we have this metric, which is much simpler. Um, let me get rid of the primes so we can stare at it a little bit.
we'd like to simplify it even further. So this is a kind of ugly term because it's off, uh, off diagonal in the metric. Uh, so the question, can we get rid of, can I remove D by a coordinate transformation? Now, I don't want to mess up this term. This term is really nice. This term, and the whole point of these coordinates, in fact, is that if I travel around the sphere, and what is the sphere? This is a two-sphere. If I travel around this two-sphere at constant r, now the sphere is the orbit of the rotation group. Right? Take a point on the sphere, apply a rotation, it just carries me around the sphere. So this, what it's telling me is the area of the orbits, the area of the orbits of SO3 is 4 pi r squared. Because you see, if I stay at fixed r and fixed t, all of this is zero anyway. So the only part of the metric is this, this one, and that's telling you the metric on the sphere. And the metric on the sphere is just the same metric as on, in flat space. And so the area is 4 pi r squared. So that's kind of the basis of Schwarzschild coordinates, is that the area is always 4 pi r squared, just the same as the flat space metric. All the interesting and strange stuff is going to go on here. So I don't want to change r, OK? But I can still change t. So. The only thing we can do is to change t. So let's define a t prime by dt prime equals, I'm going to try and redefine t to cancel this term. c of r and t dt plus d of r and t dr. Okay, so that would be, that's an equation which defines t prime in terms of t, or dt prime in terms of t and r. Uh, this is going to be arbitrary. Um, and then you'll see something nice happens. Now, now why, did I, why did I do that? Obviously, if I calculate dt prime squared, I'm going to get c squared dt squared from this term uh, squared, I'm going to get a cross term, which is 2cd dt dr. OK, so the first term, the ratio of the first to the second term is exactly what we need to mimic this term. So I have c squared, and then I have 2cd. But here I have c and 2d. So in the, they're in the same ratio, right? So then. Um, so actually, ds squared is equal to minus dt squared, dt prime squared, over f squared of r and t times c of r and t. OK, so this term will reproduce, obviously, this thing squared gives you f squared c squared on the top. I cancel the f squared and I divide by c to get back c. The cross term gives me 2cd. So I have 2cd in the numerator. Cancel the c with this, and, um, and that reproduces this term. So the metric is equal to this, plus, now I get a d squared term, but that's just multiplying dr squared, which I have anyway. So I'll combine it with the other dr squared term over, actually, I add this in to cancel it, is the way to say it, um, plus E of R and T, dr squared plus R squared, d omega 2 squared. 
okay? So the point is that this term is going to generate a minus d squared term. I need to add this back in to cancel it and reproduce this e factor in front of the dr squared. Okay, so that's my new metric. And what is this? Well, this is just some arbitrary function, right? Arbitrary function of r and t. And so we're just going to redefine that to be b of r and t. And this, this, is, again, this is some arbitrary function. Um, uh, and this will be, um, so we'll, we'll redefine this term to be minus a of r and t dt prime squared. So I've managed to cancel the cross term. Now what I have to still convince you is that it's possible to do this uh, change of coordinates. So is it possible to change coordinates from t and r to d, d t prime and dr um, in such a way? So what I have to show you is there is a function t prime, i.e., is there a function, a function t prime of r and t such that dt prime is proportional to c dt plus d dr, right? Does this function exist? So it's not hard to convince yourself it does exist, but only if you include this factor here, f. Right? If I just tried to write this down, then in general there is no such function. Um, but the, the fact that I'm free to introduce that function f, this is, f is always called, often called an integrating factor. Okay, because you've got some differential relation, you want dt prime to be proportional to some uh, linear combination of infinitesimals, but uh, you really want to integrate that and show there is a coordinate transformation. There is a t prime. The freedom to introduce an integrating factor is what allows you to show that. So let's, let's see how that works. Well, if there was such a function, then, so if t prime exists, then I can differentiate it. So dt prime is dt prime dt, dt plus dt prime dr, dr, and this should equal to f c dt um, plus f d dr, and so we. So we just equate the coefficients, dt, this should be true for all dt and all dr, so dt prime dt is equal to f of r and t times c of r and t, and dr prime d, sorry, d, dt prime dr is equal to f of r and t times d of r and t. Now, if these two equations are true, there is a very important consistency condition. What's the consistency condition? For consistency, we must have... What do you know about partial derivatives? Can I, so the question is, can I solve these equations? The first thing to do when you see some equations, like I ask, are they even consistent? So it means there's a function t prime of r and t, whose partial t derivative is this, and whose partial r derivative is that. Well, what else? How can I check if that's consistent? Act twice, right? So for consistency, we must have 
dt prime dr dt, d2t is d2t prime dr dt is dt dr. Why? Because partial derivatives commute. Okay, and you can see that's a very non-trivial equation. It involves these guys. So we must have d by dr of f r and t c r and t equals d by dt of f r and t d r and t. Now, in particular, imagine that I, I didn't use the f. Imagine that I just said f equals 1. And this is not going to work, is it? Because I'm saying that the r derivative of c must equal the d, t derivative of d. There's nothing which guarantees that. And, and in general, that'll be wrong. OK, so it's, the, it's only the existence of f which saves the day. Your only hope of solving this equation is that f is a free function. You can choose it to be whatever you like. So we can write this equation down as dtf. You see, you can, you can solve this equation for the partial derivative. dtf, dtfd plus fdtd is equal to the rfc plus fdrc. And we are assuming c and d are known. So the question is, can I solve this equation? Can we always solve this equation? So the answer is yes, you can. Yes, at least locally. Uh, that means at least as a, for example, as a Taylor series, you can certainly solve it because you imagine fixing f of r and 0. So could be anything. Pick f to be some function at t equals 0. Here's t and here's r. And I fix f along here. OK. Then this equation, so I know everything here at t equals 0. And this equation tells me the first derivative of f. So this gives me dt of f uh, r0, right? Because I know everything. I know this coefficient. I know all these other things. So I can just solve this equation for the first derivative of f with respect to t. And then similarly, I can just differentiate this equation with respect to t, d by dt of this equation gives you, let's call that star, d by dt of star determines d2f dt squared in terms of f at r and 0 and df dt at r and 0, etc. So you can just keep on differentiating this equation and you can get all the derivatives of f at t equals 0. OK, so what you can construct is f of r t is equal to f of r 0 plus dt f of r at t evaluated at t equals 0 plus 1 half dt squared f of r and t at t equals 0, etc. OK. So that, uh, so in general, you can always solve this equation to get at least the Taylor series of f for all t. So you're not going to run into any uh, obvious contradiction. OK, so that proves that this method is sensible. I can redefine dt prime to get rid of the cross terms. And now I'm left with a much simpler metric.
So we're left with uh, ds squared equals minus a of r and t d um, t squared. And, and, and here you see all these functions were functions of r and t, but of course t is a function of r and t. t. T is a function of r prime. r prime equals r, t prime equals some function of t and r, but that we assume those functions are invertible. So t is a function of t prime and r. Okay, And, and so I'm going to take this and then drop the prime on the t. So we'll drop the prime on the t. <clears throat> and this is all we're left with. <clears throat> okay, so this is the calculation Schwarzschild went through to try to simplify the metric. And so you see, he knew a lot about partial, partial differential equations and so on, uh, that he was able to argue that the most general spherically symmetric metric can always be put in this form, where it's completely diagonal, and there are only two uh, arbitrary functions, or two, uh, two functions not fixed by spherical symmetry alone. So now we're going to use the Einstein equations to fix these functions. And now we want to use r mu nu equals zero to fix a and b. <clears throat> and in the process of doing this, we're going to prove something called Birkhoff's theorem. So we shall prove that the most general spherically symmetric uh, solution of r mu nu equals zero of the Einstein equation is static. So that's kind of remarkable, that just by insisting the solution is spherically symmetric, we're going to show that actually it doesn't depend on time. Right? We, we, we will prove that. That's what the Einstein equations imply. That's already telling you a black hole is a rather, rather a special thing. It can't wobble, right? If I have a blob, there's no reason it can't be time dependent. In most theories, if you found a solution which is a blob, you could always uh, wobble it a bit, make it a function of time. Cannot do that in general relativity. If it is spherically symmetric, it has to be static. So this is called Birkhoff's theorem. And actually, I don't know whether Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild may approve that as well. I haven't looked at the original papers, but the result is attributed to Birkhoff, which it, who was a mathematician. <clears throat> but we're going to see it just follows from the Einstein equations directly. All right, so now we have to do some nasty algebra, or more nasty algebra. And uh, let's introduce some notation to make our lives slightly easier. We will call dt of a equal to a dot, and dr of a equal to a prime, etc. Same for b. And so I don't have to keep writing these derivatives. <coughs> now, all we do is plug this into our formulae for the connection. Connection. And here, what I highly recommend to all of you is download a piece of software. You may have it already. They have it already. Uh, I mean, is it the one from Jim Hartle's book? Uh, the, 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 the most transparent one I know is just, uh, if you go to Jim Hartle, James Hartle's website, it says software for book. 
Uh, the software was actually written by somebody called Leonard Parker, who I think is in Madison or somewhere, but he's quite a famous figure in quantum field theory and curved space-time. So there's a little software package. You can stick your metric in, and it'll spit out the connection and the Riemann tensor and all of that. Okay, but I, I do advise you to do some of this on your own first. Okay, and when you get bored, then use the software. The trouble with using software is if, if that's all you do, you, you won't see any of the clever tricks. Right, and that's a real pity because the software in the end is pretty dumb. So very often you'll try and do some calculation, the software says there's no, you know, it doesn't work or it's impossible or something. It's just because the software is really dumb. Okay. So I, I always warn all my students, don't, you know, use Mathematica, but don't rely on it. Because the tricks we have as theoretical physicists are way bigger than anything Mathematica knows about. And so it's really that combination of the clever tricks and the software that works. The software cannot uh, do uh, clever things. Quite the opposite. If all you do is use software, you'll just become a, a machine yourself. <laughs> right. And you're more than a machine, <clears throat> I can assure you. Okay. So let's calculate these, these connections. <clears throat> this is quite a pain, but I do encourage you to do some of these at least yourself. I'll just write down the answers here. Let's see where they come from. Okay, it's really not that difficult. So I write this thing down. What is gamma mu nu lambda? It's a half g mu alpha, g lambda alpha comma nu plus g nu alpha comma lambda minus g nu lambda comma alpha. Actually, the, the professionals in this field, it's quite amazing to see them working. So one of my colleagues in Cambridge was somebody called Gary Gibbons, who you may have heard of, Gibbons and Hawking. So, you know, uh, he would never use software, <laughs> okay? So you give him some metric like this, and in about five minutes, everything will be calculated. It's really very impressive. And, and they, they know all the tricks in the trade, <clears throat> how to speed up the calculation, which I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> so let's, let's, uh, let's just calculate TTT. Right? It's really not very difficult. If this is t, the metric's diagonal, right? So if this index is t, that has to be t. It's the only non-zero value. The alpha has to be t. All of these are t. t, 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 everywhere. Two pluses, one minus. I've got one plus. So I just get g, t, t, comma, t. g, t, t is minus a. Here I get minus a inverse. All right, so I get a dot over 2a. All right, so it's really... Uh, not hard, um, etc. So gamma T R R is uh, so just drink lots of coffee, and it'll become easy. Uh, gamma T T R. There are more efficient ways of calculating using differential forms, but there's quite an there's more of an overhead in terms of learning how to use them. So I won't do that in this course. Uh, A prime over 2B. Gamma <clears throat> RTR equals B dot over 2B. Gamma RRR equals B prime over 2B. And then you keep going. Gamma r theta theta equals minus r over b. Gamma r phi phi minus r sine squared theta over b. Gamma theta r theta equals 1 over r. These are just the connections on a sphere, so no, nothing new there. Minus sine theta cos theta. 
<clears throat> gamma phi r phi is one over r gamma phi phi theta is cot theta. Okay, so all other components zero. So now we have all the gammas. And then, uh, then you can see we can just get all the Riemann curvature components. because we have the formula that Riemann tensor rho lambda mu nu goes like d gamma plus or minus plus gamma, I think we had it, yeah, plus gamma gamma minus and then mu to nu, right? So we had some formula like that. Um, and you can just plug the gamma in and differentiate away. And then, of course, you have to get the Riemann uh, Ricci tensor by contracting the Riemann tensor, rho lambda rho nu. And so all that is just painful, and the so software package will do it all for you. But I do encourage you to think about it and realize where the terms are coming from. And so now we have, yeah, I. To write all these out, a prime, b prime. They involve two derivatives of the metric, obviously. Um, it will be worth it, I promise. Right now it looks horrible. Just thank your lucky stars, you don't have cannonballs flying around while you're, while you're doing this. Honestly, some miracles are going to happen, which will be very exciting. So don't lose hope. R theta theta is 1 minus 1 over B plus RB prime over 2B squared minus RA prime over a, B, and then R phi phi is just sine squared theta R theta theta. Okay, and you can, actually you can, you can see certain symmetries appearing. You notice that for the metric, G, you know, the metric comes from here, so G uh, this guy is d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So g theta theta and g phi phi are in the ratio of sine squared theta, and you see exactly the same thing in R. That's not surprising. Why? Because R is a symmetric matrix, 4 by 4 matrix, and you have the same symmetries as the metric. So you should expect to see similar sym symmetry relations in the Ricci uh, tensor as in the metric. So that's it. Well, it wasn't too bad, was it? 
and I'll write down all these equations. So the, the nice thing is that we, we can actually solve all of them. Now, the first interesting uh, equation, let's, uh, let's number them. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, equation three is the easiest to solve. What, is this, what does equation three tell you? So that quantity has to be zero. All the components of the Ricci, scale, Ricci tensor must be zero. What does three tell you? Obviously, it tells you b dot equals zero. What does that mean? What does it mean about b? Remember, b is a function that means d by dt of b of r and t equals zero. b is what? b is constant in time. And what does that mean? b is only a function of r. Exactly. So b equals b of R only. So that's pretty amazing. Einstein equations just don't allow B to depend on time. Okay, B can only depend on radius. That's the first hint that the solution may be static. <clears throat> now, of course, Knowing that, we can drop lots of terms. Because if b dot is zero, then all of these are zero. OK. And now things are looking much more hopeful. Uh, let's look at the first and the second equations. What should I do to simplify them? How about trying to get rid of the second derivative terms? Right, that seems like a good strategy. How would I do that? Let's uh, let's take um, let's take one plus a over b times two. Because if I multiply two by a over b, I'm going to reproduce this term. And since it has a minus sign, they will cancel. All right, so it makes sense to add one to a over b times two. And what we get is um, 1 over r a prime over b plus b prime a over b squared. So <clears throat> yes, yeah, so this term cancels that. All right, these cancel, these cancel. Um, these cancel. And so I'm just left with this one, a prime over b times r plus, um, plus uh, b prime times a over b squared r. So this is zero. Now, if that's zero, then obviously b a prime multiplying through by b b squared, b a prime plus b prime a equals zero, and that means that b a prime equals zero. So that means that b a is a function of t only. Right, because B A, the R derivative of B A is zero, so B A can only be a function of T. So what that tells you is that A uh, is equal to a function of T over B, and B is only a function of R. So that's very nice, because we can now go back to the metric the s squared is equal to minus f of t dt squared over b of r, okay, plus 
B of R dr squared plus R squared d omega 2 squared. How can I simplify this even further? Redefine T. Redefine T. Yeah, you see, we know the metric must have three positive, one negative eigenvalues. So we know that the, whatever this F is, it has to be positive. So I can take square roots. Oops. F must be positive. So define uh, dt prime to equal square root of f of t dt, right, which just means that i.e. t prime is the integral of root f of t dt. That's always possible. There's an arbitrary constant of in integration because it's an in integral, but not to worry, that, that doesn't matter. We, we can just pick it in some arbitrary way. And, uh, and this means that ds squared is equal to minus dt squared, dt prime squared over b of r plus b of r dr squared plus r squared d omega 2 squared. So that's now looking very hopeful because we, we've already shown it's static. Right, so the metric is static. So that's the proof of Birkhoff theorem. But uh, we know more than this because actually we have an equation for, uh, for B. Uh, let me move these boards uh, up so that you can, can. Can you see that corner or does it need to be? You can see it? Okay. Can you see it? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me move it. Up halfway. Okay, so we've got the, the metric in this form, and then as usual, we'll drop the prime because it was just an arbitrary label. And uh, how am I going to solve for B prime, for, for B? So I've got the metric in this form. I now know that um, I uh, drop the prime and we'll, and we'll have, and now A is just one over B, right? A is only a function of R, and it's equal to one over BR, right? That's... This is the A. Okay, so we're now allowed to use A equals 1 over B uh, of R. And so A of A equals 1 over B of R. So now I can use the fourth equation. Right, so I just plug in that A is 1 over B. And the last term will simplify, so I have 1 minus 1 over b plus rb prime over 2b squared. Now, if a is 1 over b, then a prime over a is minus b prime over b. Right, if a is 1 over b. Because when I differentiate 1 over b, I get minus b prime over b squared. So a prime, and, and that and b is 1 over a, so a prime over a is b minus b prime over b. Um, and so the last term, I have plus r b prime over 2 b squared. So these last two just add, and I get 1 minus 1 over b plus r b prime over b squared equals 0. So that's the fourth equation. Um, now, this equation, too, is not difficult to solve because what it says is that 1 equals r over b prime. So if you take this stuff on the right-hand side, then obviously um, r over b prime is equal to 1 over b, differentiating the r, and then I have 
uh, differentiating to the b, I get minus rb prime over b squared, which is exactly what I have here. So this equation I can integrate. B is only a function of r. There's no, no, well, there's no subtleties at all in this equation. So this means that r over b is equal to r plus constant. And so this means that b, so let's divide out by the r, this becomes 1 plus k over r. So b is 1 over 1 plus k over r. Okay, where k is an arbitrary integration constant. And so we have solved it. And so in these coordinates, the metric is minus um, b is this, and so obviously a is the inverse of that. So in these coordinates, the metric looks like 1 plus k over r dt squared plus dr squared over 1 plus k over r plus r squared d omega 2 squared. So that's the short child solution. Schwarzschild metric. And uh, what is the constant A? Uh, K. What is K? So to see what K is, let us look at large R. At large R, this correction is small. At large R, G mu nu is approximately eta mu nu, because if I drop this correction, I just have the met Minkowski metric in uh, spherical polars, right? So at large R, this metric is just Minkowski. So this is just 3D flat space in spherical polars. And so all of this is just Minkowski. So G is eta mu nu plus H mu nu. And we can read off that H0, 0, 0 is equal to, so H0, 0 is the perturbation to the time, time component is minus K over R. And um, if you remember from our discussion of a particle moving in the Newtonian limit, this was minus 2 phi, where phi is the Newtonian potential. This is the Newtonian, I think I called it phi g, Newtonian gravitational potential. And that is just equal to 2 g m over r c squared. OK, so here we have an interpretation of the constant k. The constant k is just related to the mass of the object as measured by Newtonian gravity a long way away from uh, at, at a large distance from the object. So now we can write down ds squared equals minus dt squared, 1 minus 2 gm over rc squared, plus dr squared over 1 minus 2 gm over rc squared, plus r squared d omega 2 squared. So that's the usual way of writing the Schwarzschild metric. Uh, where m is the mass as determined uh, 
um, uh, at large R by comparing with Newton. Okay, so if I have a black hole of uh, some mass m, or equivalently some constant k, I know that if I put a particle here in orbit around it, it's going to follow Newton's uh, equation uh, to a very good approximation. In fact, it won't quite follow Newton. There will be corrections, as I explained. If you study a planet, for example, in an elliptical orbit, uh, the, the orbit will precess slightly. And that is be precisely because this metric is not exactly describing Newtonian gravity. So we'll do that next time. We'll see the precession of Mercury. Uh, this radius, so we often write this as 1 minus rs over r, where rs is 2gm over c squared, is the Schwarzschild radius. OK, so what happens at the Schwarzschild radius? You know, at, at, at large r, this looks like Newtonian gravity. But as I come into smaller r, what, what happens? Can you describe what happens to space-time? If I fall into a black hole and I approach this RS radius, what happens in the metric? Is it, is it a bit worrying? What's going on with time? It stops. Yeah, so the coefficient of the time-time direction goes to zero. That's a bit disturbing. Makes you wonder, can I invert the metric anymore? I mean, that is, uh, is there a time anymore? What about if I went to radii smaller than the Schwarzschild radius? Let's imagine I go through the Schwarzschild radius, come out the other side. What's the sign of this term? Now positive. Because this guy, if r is too small, this term, this is negative. That cancels the minus. So now time is a space-like direction. OK? And notice r is now a time-like direction. Because this guy also changes sign. So as you go through r, the Schwarzschild radius, time turns into space, and space turns into time. And uh, But it's... It's a little bit worrying. You know, can I even go through there? Because the metric looks singular. Right? The, the, the components of the metric are singular. Actually, the, uh, what happens to the de determinant of the metric? It's fine, right? If I calculate the determinant, this cancels this. So maybe it's still fine. We insist that the metric has three negative and one positive eigenvalue. So I need the determinant always to be negative, right, if, if GR makes sense. And that's actually fine. The determinant is fine. The determinant is negative outside the black hole. It's negative inside the black hole. So that would indicate that maybe, maybe it's not really a physical thing. Maybe there's something wrong with these coordinates. And uh, indeed, that's what we'll see uh, tomorrow. So something very strange happens, very strange things happen as r decreases to rs and and less than rs and uh, becomes less than rs so time becomes space T becomes a spatial coordinate. R becomes a time-like coordinate.
That's a first clue that something... So what do you think happens when I fall across RS? It'll turn out there's no problem falling across RS. There's nothing stopping you falling. So if you fall across the short shell radius, but R is now the time. So what do you have to, what do you have to do? We have, all physical objects have to go forward in time, right? Massive particles, we saw that. Massive particles always have time-like world lines. They can't try to push them up to the speed of light. It will, their energy will, uh, the mass, their mass will diverge. You can't push a, a massive particle faster than the speed of light. So we all have to go forward in time, unfortunately. We'd love to go back in time, <laughs> become younger but we all have to get older. Now, when you fall into a black hole, R is the time. The radius is the time. So what, what does that tell you? You have to fall. You can't go backwards in R. Physically impossible. You fall inside the black hole, your R, the value of R, has to decrease. That means you have to hit R equals zero. And what happens at r equals zero, that looks pretty bad, right? r equals zero, something very violent is happening. Um, something very violent is happening here. And um, so, it, yeah, that's called a singularity. That's like the reverse of a Big Bang, but inside the black hole. So all of space collapses to zero size inside the black hole. So you, it's not going to be very pleasant. Um, and that's called the, uh, the singularity. So it will turn out, so it turns out that R, um, that uh, the singularity in the metric, the metric at R equals Rs is an artifact of the coordinates. Okay, these are these are bad coordinates at R equals R S. You have to change coordinates to good coordinates, and we can do that. But um, but the singularity at R equals zero is a genuine singularity and it cannot be removed. Be removed by coordinate transformation, by changing coordinates. So tell me how I can prove that. It's not, not difficult to prove. I want to prove that the singularity in this metric at r equals zero can never be removed by changing coordinates. How, how do I prove that? Yes, but uh, that, that's the whole idea, right? So I want to prove that there is no possible general coordinate transformation which will make this go away. So the way to do it is to, all you need to do is identify some quantity which does not change under any coordinate transformation, right? You could find a quantity that does not change under any coordinate transformation. And if you show that quantity is infinite, at r equals zero, then there's nothing you can do ever to make it finite. Okay, so what do we know that does not change under coordinate transformation? So which quantities do not change? Do not change under coordinate transformations. You know this from the definition. Product of two formatures. So. That's right, but there's a name for it. There's a name for a quantity which doesn't change. A scalar. a scalar. Any scalar doesn't change. Phi prime of x prime equals phi of x. That is telling you that in the... In the so I have some point where phi of x is infinity, Right? Uh, in the in the original system, 
this equation tells you that in the new coordinates, the value of the scalar at the corresponding coordinate, in the new coordinates, to the same point, is going to have exactly the same value. So all you need to do is to show that there is a scalar quantity, which is infinite at r equals zero, and that, will, that just tells you immediately that no conceivable coordinate transformation will change. Coordinate transformations do not change the value of scalars. So what's a scalar? We don't have much to play with. We have the metric. We have the Riemann tensor. Do you have any scalars? You can just contract. Pardon? Ricci scalar. Now, you might try that. Is that a good idea? What's the Ricci scalar? Zero. It's zero. So that's no good anyway, because that's zero everywhere. So that's certainly not going to show any singularity. OK, so I can't use the Ricci scalar. But there are other ways to make scalars. Try and think. How do I make a scalar? Hmm? Very good, very, very good. OK, so let's take our Riemann tensor. This is not zero. You see, you can't use this guy either. I can't use the Ricci tensor either, because that's zero. The solution solves this equation, <laughs> right? There's strictly zero everywhere. But Riemann is not zero. In fact, I've told you already, the only situation in which Riemann is zero everywhere is where you're in flat space. This is not flat space. OK, so let's take the Riemann tensor and make a scalar. Right, so this is a scalar. So using this, uh, I mean, you can do the calculation, or you can just use the software and calculate Riemann squared and see what it's equal to. Now, let's just guess. By, let's see if we can guess by dimensions what is this going to give us. What do you think it's going to give us? If I, if I put this into here and calculate, what am I going to get? 1 over r squared? No, but close. The metric goes like 1 over r. Ricci scale, Riemann tensor is two derivatives of the metric. This is 1 over r. I get two derivatives of this, I'm going to get 1 over r cubed. Right? And then I'm going to square it. So I'm going to get 1 over r to the sixth. So I expect to get something like gm squared over r to the sixth with some number here. And uh, so indeed, that's the answer. You can do all the algebra, and then I don't remember the number. It doesn't really matter. But you can see that at r equals 0, this is infinite. So the fact you have a scalar which is infinite, tells you that the space-time is singular at r equals 0, and there's nothing you can ever do to change that. Infinite at r equals 0 in all coordinate systems. So that's a real singularity. OK, I think we will quit there. Uh, next time we're going to, oh, I wanted to show you some movies. Let's, uh, let's, let's do that. OK, so what are we looking at? Uh, I think we can do full screen. OK, so this is a picture of the center of the galaxy. So we live in the Milky Way, uh, roughly um, 25,000 light years. We're, we're about 25,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. The center of the Milky Way 
is uh, has uh, lots of stars in its neighborhood. And only recently, and this was starting in the 1990s, using the Keck telescope in Hawaii, which is one of the most pop, um, powerful optical telescopes, people were able to start watching the stars in the very middle of the galaxy. Okay, so the movie will show you the orbits of all these stars as they're actually seen. The person who, who leads this work, is uh, her name is Andrea Gez. And it's really uh, very remarkable work. So people had speculated that there might be a black hole in the center of the Milky Way. But uh, these are the observations. So let's just watch those stars. And the time on the top right, you see the year. So the observations took over a decade. And uh, so let's just repeat that. I could, I could watch that endlessly. OK, so that's a very impressive one, the brown one, right? And here's the, OK. Obviously, there's something pretty weird over there, right? Which is causing all these stars to, um, to go to really have dramatic changes in their orbits. OK, so there's some guy just here which uh, is causing things to absolutely change their orbit. So that, from these observations and just Newton's theory, you can work out what the mass of the object must be. And that mass turns out to be four, four million solar masses. Okay, so this is called a supermassive black hole. The mass is 4 times 10 to the 6, the mass of the sun. So that's fairly convincing. There's something very massive there, but uh, who knows if it's a black hole. So the next step in that process is to say, well, what's the short shell radius? How big is the black hole? And can we look at it? Could we possibly see it? So the mass is 4 million solar masses. It turns out the Schwarzschild radius is uh, 17 times the radius of the sun. OK, so it's a big thing, roughly 10 times as big as the sun. But it's a million times more massive than the sun. And as I said, it's located 25,000 light years away from us. OK, so this Schwarzschild radius uh, tra translates into 1.2 times 10 to the 10 meters. 25,000 light years is 2.4 times 10 to the 20 meters. So from this, you can get the angle, the angular size on the sky. And that's what astronomers care about. So obviously, there's this object. Here's its Schwarzschild radius. Um, and it's at some distance d. So the angle it subtends on the sky is rs over d. And that is approximately 0.5 times 10 to the minus 10 radians. It's a very, very tiny angle. So can we see such an angle? Well, uh, the way you see such small angles is you need a very big telescope, right? Because the angular resolution of a telescope, the resolution, theta, do you remember the formula for the resolution? What is it? Lambda over D, very good. Lambda over D. 
Uh, D, in this case, is the size of the telescope. Let's call it capital D so it doesn't get confused with that one. So the angular resolution of a telescope is the wavelength divided by the size of the aperture. Let's imagine we built a telescope as big as the Earth. Right, so we use the whole diameter of the Earth. That's going to help. Let's use, uh, you know, feasible radio waves. Um... Uh, where people do radio astronomy. And so uh, the upper limit of radio astronomy uh, are frequencies of about 1,000 gigahertz. And this corresponds to lambda of about 0.3 uh, millimeters. So a radio wave of about a third of a millimeter is about the upper limit of what people use for radio astronomy. So the lambda would be, um, the lambda is one third times 10 to the minus three in meters. The size of the Earth in meters is how many? About 10,000 kilometers, the diameter of the Earth. So that is 10 to the 10 to the 7 meters. So that's one third times 10 to the minus 10. What do you know? <laughs> okay, so we can do it. <laughs> one third is less than a half. <laughs> okay, we can just do it. Isn't it incredible? This happens again and again and again in cosmology. You ask some ridiculously impossible question. Can I measure this? And the answer is usually it's just at the limit of what we can do, right? And then you work for 50 years and it happens, right? It's weird. Uh, the, so this is probably just because we always underestimate what we can do. We're always close to the threshold of doing something mind-boggling, all right? And so I believe this very, very, very strongly, for example, that in uh, the next 50 years, we will image the Big Bang. I mean, we will see exactly what happened, where did everything come from. I, I think that's a near certainty. But uh, most people think it's hopelessly impossible. But if you start to think about the practicalities, th there is actually nothing stopping us from seeing the Big Bang using gravitational waves. But anyhow, this is just on the limit of what's doable. And in fact, it's happening. So next year, this will happen. And let me show you some. Uh, and uh, one of the leaders of this project is here at Perimeter. Anyone know who that is? Broderick. Avery Broderick. OK. So these are pictures made by Avery. Um, this is the black hole in the center of our galaxy. So that's the short shot radius. And what's happening is there's a cloud of gas surrounding it. The gas is emitting radio waves at roughly these wavelengths. And so Avery and his friends have gotten every radio, well, many radio telescopes, I think about six or eight radio telescopes all around the world, one at the South Pole, one at Chile, uh, where are all the others? I'm not sure where all the others are, some in Europe. So he's got all these radio telescopes. They're all looking in this direction. They're all taking data. The data is stored on uh, hard drives. And then they've got to be synchronized, incredibly synchronized. So they need uh, atomic clocks at each telescope. And you, you need to know very, very accurately the time stream, and you need to synchronize the time streams. And then you create an interference pattern between what um, these different radio telescopes see. And in that way, the whole Earth really is a single telescope. Okay, so they, they've done it. This is the simulated image. So this is actually the appearance. If I had perfect vision, and I could just look at the black hole and see the radio emission from this cloud of dust, this is literally due to the black hole, that, the, that I don't see radio emission coming so much coming from this direction because the black hole is just swallowing it all, right? There's stuff around the edges. I can, it, 
manages to escape. So that's the simulated image. This is Avery's projection of what the EHT will actually see due to its limited uh, resolution and uh, noise and all kinds of other instrumental effects. That's his expectation for what they would see. So it's not quite the real thing, but it's pretty clear there's a black uh, disk. And uh, so, as it says, 2017, 2018, that's what they'll do. Okay, so I, I happen to know that they've already got something like that. <laughs> they haven't gone public yet with it, but um, they will be doing that soon. So, um, yeah, so we can literally see. There is a big black hole. We can see its short shard radius, and it's sitting in the center of our galaxy. One day, probably, people will travel there and have holidays in the <laughs> next to a black hole. It might be a really good uh, opportunity for a casino. <laughs> okay, any questions? Yeah. Um, if you image the big, the big Bang using gravitational waves, would you see everything you wanted to see about it, or is that? Like yeah, ultimately, I think so. Ultimately, this that's the amazing thing about the world. It doesn't seem to stop us learning all its secrets. We don't know why that's true. I mean, why on earth should some basically slightly overdeveloped monkey be able to figure out, you know, where the whole thing came from? It's really absurd. We live in a completely absurd universe where, for some reason we don't understand, we can actually figure things out. Uh, we don't know why maths works. We haven't a clue why mathematics is successful in describing nature. But it doesn't just work, it works at this level. I mean, honestly, this is completely ridiculous. Somebody in, in the trenches in 1915, you know, was trying to solve some PDEs, and his solution is sitting in the middle of the galaxy in perfect form, absolute accuracy, no free parameters in this at all. So this is what really annoys me, is when people who do theoretical physics start making models, which are really complicated and arbitrary and this and that and the other, uh, I feel very let down because the, the real successes of physics are, are somehow much more powerful than that. It's not like any other field in science. Nothing, no other field in science would make such a dramatic prediction based purely on physical principles, and mathematical reasoning. It's just bizarre. Yeah. When you say there are no free parameters, does that mean that the Schwarzschild radius is also just... No? Well, yeah, strictly speaking, there was one parameter, which is this mass m. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, but, you know, c, we need this measure the speed of light from other things. Um, so... Yeah, there's one parameter in Einstein's theory. And I've cheated a little bit because in th this metric assumes spherical symmetry. Actually, black holes can have angular momentum, and generally they do have angular momentum. So that's another set of parameters. It's, I guess it's three parameters because it has a direction and a magnitude. But um, the black hole in the center of the Milky Way so far, the evidence is the angular momentum is small. And so the only parameter that matters for this picture is, the, uh, is just the mass. Um, so yeah, remarkably few uh, parameters. No parameters is an exaggeration, but one important parameter, which is the mass. But you think of the number of observations being fit by that mass. I mean, all the stellar orbits are fix that mass, this guy fixes the mass, you know, there are going to be lots of other measurements that will fix the mass. And uh, so the, the theory is, just seems to be right. And it's completely bizarre. I mean, Einstein wrote down this equation, r mu nu equals zero. He had, or I mean, g mu nu is t mu nu. Had no intention of describing black holes. Had no idea they could exist. Right? The equation gave this object. 
And in fact, because, you know, I, I should emphasize that when people, when Schwarzschild got the solution, so Einstein thought it was a beautiful solution, but he thought it would be very unlikely this solution really is valid all the way to the Schwarzschild radius because it looks singular there. So Einstein and others imagine probably what goes on is you have some big, big object like a star, and this metric is valid everywhere outside because T mu nu is zero outside, so R mu nu is zero, right? So the metric is valid everywhere outside a star. By the way, I should emphasize this, that this metric is the unique spherically symmetric metric in the absence of matter, okay? So What's the metric of the Earth? Well, to the extent the Earth is spherically symmetric, that's the metric outside the Earth, because T mu is zero outside the Earth. That was the only assumption. So Einstein and others imagined this metric would only hold outside some radius. Um, but actually, it does hold all the way to the short shell radius and even inside. And uh, that's what we're seeing. But I think you need, you need your break. <laughs> okay, so I'll see you tomorrow morning.